good. Welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. For the next hour, we're going to be talking about liberty with a capital L. Not your civil liberties, nor your moral or criminal liberties. This is the capital L liberty. Where does it come from? How do we preserve it? I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, making sure that the phone calls get in and that you get on the air with us today. Joining me in the studio, across from me to my left, is Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises. Remember, for all of your construction needs, if you need some fill dirt for hemp, coming up here in uh, the new construction season, you can give Bighorn Enterprises a call. Also, joining me from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty is Dave Giesel. And uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. You were planning for Dave or planning for all of us? You're confusing me, John. Oh, the Campaign for Liberty. Right. How's that going? Have we gotten liberty yet? (laughs) Have you Ron Pauled today? It's ongoing, (laughs) let's say. (laughs) All right. Gentlemen, what is uh, the topic for today? Well, we want to keep it cheerful today. (laughs) So we're going to start off with... uh, no, final notification of threat assessment to Michael Anderson. Now, this is coming from where? Uh, Transportation Security Administration by first class mail, certified mail, return receipt requested. Mr. Michael Orion Anderson. Oh, that kind of tells me why he's out there. His middle name. Mr. Anderson, on April 29th, Transportation Security Administration, TSA, served upon you, the Federal Aviation Administration, an initial notification of threat assessment pursuant to 49 U.S. Code, blah, blah, blah. Now, this is the best part right here. This is from Gail somebody. After personally reviewing the initial notification of threat assessment and materials made available to the TSA, I have determined... I have determined that you pose and are suspected of posing a security threat. Accordingly, TSA is currently notifying the FAA of the determination that you pose and blah, blah, blah. So now they're taking away his um, airman certificates, ratings, authorizations, or whatever. Anyways, the best part of this whole thing is that uh, after she, one lady, personally inter- reviews this information that she got, she alone determined that he poses a security threat to the United States of America. And therefore, he no longer has a right to travel, basically. Uh, I think he can still fly if he goes through the hooplia, but uh, he can't actually fly a plane himself. He does have a pilot's license. Well, he no longer has a pilot's license hmm. because of this. Well, that sounds perfectly constitutional to me. I mean, it's right there in black and red. What is it, like the First Amendment or so that yeah. says that one person, if if endowed with the right authority, can go ahead and strip you of any of your liberties that they deem fit? This letter serves as the final notification of your threat assessment. So that's awesome. This lady is, I have determined. So one person who's not not elected by anyone, never probably even been on the news. Mm-hmm. We don't even know who she is. Well, that's what the jury system is all about, right? You appoint yeah. one person to decide for all of us. And this is final notification, so obviously you can't uh, appeal it to anyone or you're screwed. Well, it's not a legal um, notice, right? That's it's, true. It's an administrative bureaucratic notice, so you couldn't appeal it anyway because yep. it's not even a – it's outside the purview of uh, the legal system. The justice justice system there's a very reeks of uh, the king doesn't it quite <laughs> quite anyways i thought that would, i thought that'd be fun to start the show off well, that's with a great right lighthearted I mean, topic today thank you so much for that it's uh you know the old it, that won't happen here type of deal yeah you have another one of those uh we, we've discussed some of the um Department of Homeland Security, FBI, you might be a terrorist if notice uh, notices. And we've actually had some callers call in and say, oh, that's not real. So you ha- you brought in your hand a very uh, not real piece of paper with all of their little cute insignia on it. Yeah. Um, do you care to share that with us? Yeah. It's uh, This paper is not real. You crinkle it by the mic. Yeah, there you go. This is not a real page. <laughs> wait, wait. Let me, let me take a look at it and see okay. if we can determine how many threads it is because that is... Uh, the real yeah. determination to make sure it's not well. It doesn't look like completely, hmm. completely made up. Yeah, this is obviously uh, done off of some mimeograph machine. How the uh, <laughs> from wait, the, no, the ink didn't smudge. Did Go ahead. From the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Communities Against Terrorism: Potential Indicators of Terrorist Activities Related to Hobby Shops. 
Bum, 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 bum. Uh, wait, wait, no. uh, really? Watch out. Model Enterprise. <laughs> but you go in there, they're watching you. That's right. <laughs> Potential indicators of terrorist activities related to hobby shops. What should I consider suspicious? Yeah, we got just, you know, your basic stuff. Demonstrate unusual interest in remote-controlled aircraft. <laughs> Possessing little knowledge of activities for which he, the purchase is intended. Uh... Demonstrating no interest or enthusiasm for the hobby or sport. I thought that was kind of odd. Uh, engineering, exhibiting so, unusual. Wait, wait. I've, I've, I used to uh, uh, work at a – well, I, I was uh, sponsored by a hobby shop. I used to race RC cars. And whenever, whenever husbands would come in there, their wives would demonstrate zero interest in the hobby or sport. They're terrorists. And it was it – was, yeah. Well, I didn't know that ob- at the time. Obviously, Thank God I know obviously. that. Obviously. <laughs> What's fun right now is that... You came so close to being detonated. <laughs> this is, these, two paragra- these two sentences are on top of each other. Demonstrating no interest or enthusiasm for the hobby or the sport. Exhibiting unusual interest or specific interest in the hobby or the sport. Yeah, you have to be, you have to be comfortably <laughs> indifferent, but not too yeah. indifferent. Wait a, so wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. You're a terrorist. If you're not, you're a terrorist. That, that, to me, that sounds like they just want to make sure that they've got the bases covered. Basically, anybody who goes into a hobby shop is a terrorist. Yes. Is the way the next reading. release will be expressing moderate interest. In <laughs> <laughs> Large quantities of paintball equipment and supplies. Mm. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Yeah. That's just now finally making it onto the list. It seems to me like anybody who who has any paintball stuff should be considered a terrorist. Go ahead. And using cash, of course, we know that, or credit card in someone else's name. So at the bottom here, I think it's interesting. It's important to remember that just because someone's speech, actions, beliefs, appearance, or way of life is different does not mean that he or she is suspicious. Unless they demonstrate no interest or enthusiasm, or if they demonstrate enthusiasm or interest, then they are. So, I mean, it's just... So they ask you to take their valid IDs from them, keep records of them, talk to the customers, ask questions, observe their responses, watch for people and actions that are out of place, make note of suspicious statements, people, or vehicles. If something seems wrong, notify the law enforcement. Do not jeopardize your safety or the safety of others. Preventing terrorism is a community effort. You know, my it seems to me like when I hear something like that, the very first thought I have is I want to go into a model shop and exhibit every single one of those <laughs> just to see if I get screened or picked up by the FBI just for going to a model shop. It just it, That is my initial reaction is, you know what, and if I, I bet too that if everybody did that, They'd be so flooded with investigations. They'd have so much money running out of their or every orifice in their body trying to cover <laughs> all of those investigations that they would be required by law because of that official notice to investigate. It just seems to me like that would be a, a classic way to fight back against this madness. You know what? You're going to investigate people for going to a model shop? Fine. Investigate this. Some activities, Steve, taken individually, could be innocent but must be examined by law enforcement professionals in a larger context to determine whether there is a basis to investigate and or give them bombs from the FBI so they can create terrorism and stop them. That certainly didn't happen in Portland a couple years ago. Well, it didn't happen in Washington, D.C. What was it, a week ago? It certainly didn't happen with the underwear bomber, did it? Right, right. Oh, that was the, mm-hmm. yeah. No, it actually did happen in all of those cases. <laughs> have to Certainly find, wouldn't have anything to and, do with And you know what? There's, 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 there's nothing right, like right. finding somebody who's already a little mentally unstable and offering them a bomb and promises of making more of their life, only to turn around and arrest them for doing what you just... Isn't that what, they, isn't that what military recruitment is? Oh, <laughs> wow. snap. That is All right, we've got some bang. lines and phones bang. lighting up here. 458-TALK <laughs> is the they number. Got the bang. Let's uh, go to the phones. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hey, this is Josh. How you doing? Josh, good. What's on your mind? Well, I got a story about how I was trained by the government to detect explosives, if you guys want to hear it real quick. Oh, yeah. I uh, moved to Washington, D.C. I was unemployed, and in a fit of weakness, I uh, applied to work for the TSA. So I get a call uh, about a week later, and they wanted me to go downtown, uh, downtown D.C., and uh, run through the simulation program to see how well I could find contraband items in uh, your luggage. And so, you know, it's on a computer screen. You see uh, what the luggage looks like as it's going through the X-ray machine. 
And about halfway through the hour and a half process, I started seeing things, right? One thing looked like a human skull, cans of paint, guns and knives. And eventually, about halfway through, I just gave up and just started marking anything, right? And uh, the interview was over, finished the test, and uh, I left thinking, man, I failed big time. There's no way I'm going to get hired. And almost immediately, within days, I got a call from the supervisor. Apparently, I am one of the best detectors of contraband they've ever tested, <laughs> and they offered me a job. Now, are, now, are you telling me, Josh, that you just randomly started picking things that you didn't even realize, or, or was it that you first. just? Is it kind of like when you go out moose hunting and everything, every single shadow begins to become a moose right. in your mind? Yeah, your mother-in-law starts looking like a moose. <laughs> it, it's a trigger finger. No, at, at first I was serious. You know, I, I needed a job, right? And this looked like it was easy. I know how to stand around, and I can judge people. I'm really good at it. <laughs> and uh, so I just, I was, I really tried hard for about 45 minutes of this hour and a half test. And about halfway through, I just couldn't, I couldn't tell a AA battery from, you know, C4 or whatever they think we're smuggling in, right? I couldn't tell a cupcake frosting from uh, some kind of neurotoxin. And so I just started guessing. And then there were some things that were obviously... You know, in a fit of despair, I was obviously not like a teddy bear in a plastic bag, right? I marked that thing as contraband, you know, thinking that I'd failed. And that I, I'm not joking. I got a call from the supervisor, and I scored one of the highest scores on that test that day. And so I turned the job down and ended up working for FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good thing now because FedEx, they need good contraband. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, you know, we know we've got contraband at FedEx. They, the federal government would send in their drug-sniffing dogs every so often. But we'll still deliver it anyway. We really, really don't care unless uh, we get stopped and the cops want to take it. Hey, thank God for the free market. That's right. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Well, if you didn't anyway, have them, all the stuff you can't put on there. Thanks for the call, Josh. Yeah. Well, okay, you know, that, that's <laughs> an interesting uh, a little anecdote there. I'm, I'm sure that that's not at all the intention of the government to turn every air carrier, every, every person who travels by air into a potential terrorist. They would not do that. They have done that. Right. <laughs> no, they would never. In- interesting. That, that would never happen here. Interesting that uh, well, there's a couple of things, you know, that guessing results in one of the highest scores. Um, in, you know, in theory, if everybody just guessed, the scores would all be about the same. Huh. But, uh, yeah, also, yeah, um, that's funny. the idea of, yeah, standing in front of a machine for hours on end and actually being able to, to differentiate between anything. That was a funny call. Well, well you know, I, I, I love that call. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. It does, I, I mean, it highlights part of what we're talking about here in terms of the, the way in which we as Americans are becoming conditioned even more and more and more to accept this, well, I, I, I hate to use the word Nazi because it's been so, uh, it's made into such a caricature. People don't understand where the Nazis came from or how it started or what it was all about, but it's the National Socialist Party. That's what it was all about. It was it was wrapped up in nationalism. What? How dare you attack an American abroad? Those Americans have every right. They want you to be in a war zone. Yeah. How? What? How dare you interfere with American interests? We need to invade that country so that they cannot threaten us again. Have you um? Have you guys seen the new Navy ads? No. Uh, U.S. Navy. Not. I've seen the new Air Force ads. Okay. Uh, I, I haven't seen those. The new Navy ads. Um. The last scene in all of them is a picture of a. They zoom out and they show the entire globe and it says the Navy, a global force for good. It's just right on there. Wow. A global force for good. Right. Nice. Who came up with that one? <laughs> and that was a, I, I don't know, but it's actually honest, so that's sort of interesting. Yeah. One, one of the other things with the uh, you know the growing uh, police state apparatus that that call highlights is um, most people out there have a belief that it's actually effective, right? Right. Most people. I mean, this is just, you, you don't see massive protests at, for the TSA or anything like that. Most people think it's actually effective. And, and uh, they would willingly to submit to just about any degradation that they need to because it's to keep them safe. Right, and the only re- the only reason they think it, it's actually keeping them safe is because they have a fundamental belief that it's, that it's you know, effective or, mm-hmm. or, or possibly mm-hmm. effective. But at the end of the day, it's a guy staring at a screen for hours on end and, and not, and not having any... Right, and guessing. Yeah. Well, no, no, <laughs> well it, I, if he's good. If he's good, he's guessing. It, it gets better, though, because every single time that somebody has tried to 
get something through just to see if they can, whether it's a test, you know, a law enforcement agency trying to get a, a gun through the, the system or whether it's just some crazy guy. Yeah. And that's happened several times. Every single time they've tried, they've managed to do it and not get caught. Right. That was um, well, that was actually their excuse for letting the underwear bomber through. It's like, oh, that was just a, a test gone bad. Um, but in fact, that test, he was caught because he didn't have a passport. And at security, they said, you can't go through here. And then when he went to get on the plane, they said, you can't get on the plane. And both times, uh, they had to enter a, a, a secret on. American agency, yet to be named, um, had to intervene to get him through those points. So... Uh, so that's sort of interesting. Uh, what if, okay, now, I, I understand. It doesn't happen, Dave. Uh, I, I understand the conspiracy theory and the deal that you're, you're espousing here, Dave, that somehow there's some secret government agenda to try to keep us at war perpetually. Uh, how, however, I mean, what would have I happened if, that's secret anyway. if, 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 if that were so, and if that if that underwear bomb had been, was actually a uh, a, a, a real... Uh, government connected. I mean, what hap- What would have happened if it had actually gone off and that plane would have gone down? We would have had hundreds of Americans dead by American hands. That they would. The government would surely never sign off on killing innocent Americans just to perpetuate a war. <clears throat> well, they did a pretty good job of blaming it on this guy from Yemen who they found to be a patsy for him. Yeah. So yeah, they wouldn't. It came out in open court here in the last couple of weeks, hadn't it? Uh, yeah, Kurt Haskell uh, testified that. If if you Google Kurt Haskell, you'll find his blog. He was on that flight and uh, watched this guy in the airport and watched the uh, man escort him to the um, check-in desk and get him on the plane, even though he did not have a uh, passport. I don't think he had a boarding pass either. All right, 458-TALK is the number if you'd like to uh, call in. You can also join us in the chat room. We're up and running there, kfar660.com. Uh, it's a little more complicated to find than it used to be, but it's not that bad if you know where it is. Go to kfar660.com on the left-hand side. You'll see the Stations tab. You move your cursor over it, and you'll find some more tabs opening up. Go to the KFAR tab. Scroll down. As your cursor hits the KFAR tab, more tabs open up to the right. You see the chat room. <laughs> Click, boom, you're there. You see? This, Easy as pie. Wow. If you want to access the old shows and um, and you want to do it without... Being confused, just go oh, to our not confusing. go to our YouTube channel. It's um, it's Radio Free Fairbanks. So go to YouTube and just type in Radio Free Fairbanks. You'll find our YouTube channel, and we are finally up to date. I have every episode up to uh, up last to week. last week. Yeah, they're all up now. So that's the easiest way to find the show. Bang. And if you want to uh, check out the blog, all the shows get posted on the blog too, along with some other uh, information that that we come across, and sometimes we write an article or two. And that's uh, patriotslament.blogspot.com. And the um, best way to get in touch with us is just to leave a comment on one of the blog posts and say, hey, you guys are a bunch of idiots. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, we prefer yeah. that, though. Terrorists. You guys are a bunch of terrorists. Four, five, eight. Let me just correct you. Idi- idiots are people who, well, then we'll just leave it alone. Four, five, eight talk is the number. <laughs> Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Bill. Bill, and, what's on your uh, mind? Yeah, uh, among other uh, things, the uh, you know the wood burning issue, but uh, for, for the uh, new army slogan, in view of the uh, HIV outbreak here, uh, how about an army of fun? Army of fun? Bun, B-U-N. Bun. Oh, wow. That's a, <laughs> so I, I, wow, I, I think we're just seeing the natural progression of getting rid of the don't ask, don't tell policy, because now you don't have yeah. to tell if you're HIV positive anymore. Yeah, yeah. and then for the uh, 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 Navy, the objective is for every sailor to become a rear admiral. Oh, wow, Jeez. okay, all right. Now, this is not. I don't want this to become a uh, an anti-military screed today. I mean, come on, now, that's... that's that's, Let's make no, no, not, not at all. Uh, I ha- have a lot of respect for, for the uh, the individuals that uh, make the sacrifice to be in the military. It's just uh, the uh, you know the the policy from above that's mm-hmm. uh, despicable. Well, if if you look at it, I mean, and I and I'm this is speaking as a veteran. I'm somebody who not only served the country, I served the country overseas. I went to Bosnia, spent a year in a war zone, and you know, although we technically officially were not at war, which meant that I couldn't do my official job as an interrogator. All of my interrogations were now called 
interviews. Okay, if I if I had to sit down with a war criminal, I couldn't actually put him in custody. I could, however, interview him and get information from him. And normally, because it was you know not a a position of power, there was a little quid pro quo. We gave him a little information that he could use, and then he gave us some information that we could use, and it was all lovey dovey. Speaking as someone who did that for while I was in for five years and served in Bosnia for twelve months, I can tell you this that the way that they get people to join the armed forces with the the, the waving of the flag, the patriotic, uh, the call of duty, the sacrifice, all of that means absolutely nothing. When you get an order to go and do something that goes against your conscience, too bad. It, It has absolutely nothing to do with the service to the country. It has to do with the fact that you are under orders, and if you refuse those orders, you will be thrown in the brig. Well, why would you? Why would it be any different in the military than not being in the military? There's no difference. That's we, true. We are forced to do things that we don't agree with every day. Look at where the tax dollars go. Yeah. Yep, so exactly. it's just a natural order. You're following orders when you're out here, or you will go to the brig. Follow orders when you go in the military, or you go to the brig. Exactly. No difference. Hey, thanks for the call, Bill. Nice conditioning. All right. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you. Thank you. Yeah, right. that's the whole that's the whole Nuremberg trial. I was uh, just following principle. the principles. Yeah, you know, and what's interesting about that hmm. is um, the the Nuremberg trials conveniently only applied to the losers in that war. <laughs> I I guarantee you that the uh, the so-called winners of the Second World War, all of whom um, their nations were impoverished after the war, regardless, were uh, feeling uh, feeling um, a little bit nervous in their minds about, boy, what if this were turned around? What if I were put on trial for right. dropping a bomb that mm-hmm. killed 80,000 people mm-hmm. in less than a second? Well, and now it's happening, and Americans are getting very, very upset that our soldiers are being held to account for killing <laughs> civilians in places like Afghanistan and Iraq because it was just an act of war. You know, how, how dare they hold our You know, now our soldiers aren't going to be able to actually go and fight wars because they're going to be held accountable for their actions. How dare they put American soldiers on trial for actions taken under wartime? I agree. Bring them home. Hey, you know what? That, I think, would be probably the, one of the best solutions. However, what, look at what the world would happen. Look, I mean, look what happened what happen to the world, Josh. If we brought our troops home from places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, wait. How about we bring them home from places like Korea yeah. or Japan or <clears throat> the Germany. Germany or the Philippines? If we start bringing our troops Australia. home from these places where they've been occupying for... Yeah, the they Latin. just they just deployed to Australia. Yeah. We yeah, and you know, thank God, right? Because the dingoes and kangaroos down there they'll eat your baby. The, that's, <laughs> that's what I hear. That's what I hear. And and they take a particular and, and, interest in and RC aircraft. What would happen to <laughs> what would happen to the world if our troops were brought home? I mean, they would it would immediately become a more violent place, wouldn't it? I mean, that's what we're we're told. I mean, yeah, we were even told that last night. If we didn't have, let's see. Every, if you don't have every statute, ordinance, law, whatever, regulation, you'll die. We'll be right back. You, you got it done, Patriots Lament on KFAR. We are Local Talk Radio 660 on your you AM dial. Welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. That's uh, the song Uprising by Muse there in the background. That's uh, I, Man, I love the lyrics to that song. Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, it's just that, that idea that somehow the people are going to rise up and, and throw off this illusion that uh, we have to obey what our masters tell us and, and actually take some own responsibility for our, our, our own actions, actually take responsibility for our own future, actually go out there and refuse to be controlled by people just because they tell us that they have the right to control us. Well, they do. Uh, that's the problem, is that I... I, I you know, although I agree with everything in the song, the fact of the matter is, is that for the vast spectrum of human history, people have been sheep that have been herded by those who farmer knows best, <laughs> who, those who rise up and and tell them what to do. People are constantly. I'm and I I'm, I get this all the time. People come and ask me, Steve, what should we do? Yeah. I'm like, well, why are you asking me? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the situation with Iran and and I hear about what's going on with with Ron Paul and. And and I all we need is a good leader in the White House. Yeah. No. Uh, Aaron's made that point. Aaron's made that point before. He says, uh, you know, people will come in his store and they'll say, we need, we need one good leader. 
to give us all our our individual liberty back. <laughs> and he's pointed out what a contradiction that way of thinking is. No. Well, I think a double president would do it. <laughs> Perhaps. A, a what? Sing a double president. A double yeah. president? Yeah, I'll yeah. fill you in on that later. It's, oh, okay. It's complicated, and there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of uh, dejourness involved. And jail time. Some of that. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, and th- that that brings it though back to the local issue too, because we have it happening all the time at every layer of society, every layer of government. We have people telling us what we can and can't do. What is what is the best thing for us? You know, we have people. Um, giving us their opinion on what we can and can't do. Um, one of the and what, finding us if we don't comply. Right, but one of the uh, one of the illusions of law that um, everyone in history lives with is that the law is some sort of immutable, objective, true standard. And um, in fact, the Supreme Court uh, they don't claim that. Right, when a, when the Supreme Court makes a decision. What do you get? You get the uh, majority opinion and the dissenting opinion, right? Yeah. They actually refer yeah. to their decisions as opinions of the court, which underlies the the very nature of law. There's this um, idea in philosophy called the pessimistic induction, and it's um, basically it, it says that if you are at any point in history and you look back, <clears throat> you know, 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, whatever, you look back at any civilization and their laws and their system of ethics and politics, uh, you'll be able to pick holes in it. You'll be able to go, oh, look at these idiots. You know, they believed in uh, they believed in a sun god and a god of lightning, and um, you know, they believed in di- direct democracy and you know, mob rule and uh, or even the the founding of this country. Oh, the three fifths compromise, right? They believed in slavery, and so so the pessimistic induction is that uh, at any point in history, if you look back, you can find how other people were, uh, what we would say, wrong, right? Their opinions were wrong. And, of course, um, we are high-minded enough that we've finally figured it out, right? <laughs> we're living at the only point in history where we figured everything out, and no one's ever going to look back on us and go, oh, those, yeah, those guys were really wrong. People are going to look back on us and go, they, they'd figured it out, right? Right now, 2012... That was the end state of the development of of uh, an idea of law and ethics. Anyway, because we've perfected what well, was because wrong we've progressed, we we've made we've made progress over the years. Right, and we've reached the end state. And, and anyway, so so there's this belief uh, of that, and the pessimistic induction says no, we have no reason to believe that we've reached you know some sort of end state of understanding ideal systems of ethics or um, or morals or anything like that. If we look at history, everybody's had uh, massive problems that uh, that have gotten better in most cases. You know, with the abolition of slavery. We don't yep. we don't own each other in the in the chains uh, and offense uh, sort of scenario anymore. It's more uh, nuanced than that now. Um, so that applies now, and that's the thing. We, we, you know, on this show we question some very fundamental uh, beliefs about the state, about laws, about all this, and uh, we're we're told not to do that. In school, it's like, oh, you, you know, you live in America. It's the best country ever of all time, and it is the best country that will ever be. It has the best system of government that will ever exist, and the only just system of law. That's what you basically learn in school, and um, history would would probably tell us otherwise. And it's funny that it's always the people that are in charge of that system that tell you that. I mean, who's going to – what politician – well, I can think of one – what politician would tell you, yeah, government and laws and institution and blah, blah, blah isn't the way to go? Or at least that it should be questioned. Yeah. Right? I mean, you wouldn't go to your boss and say, hey, boss, man, this really sucks. Uh, my job sucks. I I am worthless in your employment right here. I'm not doing anything for you. You should go find something better. But you lose your job. So, of course, you're going to – of course, a politician is going to say it's the right way to go. It's the only way. It's the best thing ever, and it's never going to get any better. Or, or even a potential politician, because anybody who's trying to get into the seats of power, <laughs> what, that's their incentive to get in. Why would they want to question the very nature of it? I think we might have seen a little bit of that last night. <laughs> a little. All right, where were you last night? Uh, there was a there was an Occupy Fairbanks forum where we were discussing um, the Occupy movement, and they had a list of questions and stuff like that. So they had a panel discussion. So there was a an economist, a political scientist, a 
a uh, sociologist and uh, there's another activist guy and then a, a former um, Senate candidate and uh, and then I was there and we were just kind of we all got asked these questions and it was like you know what's your take on issue X or whatever and um, it was interesting because the politician in the room uh, opposed anybody who would suggest that maybe we question the fundamental nature of politics and the force behind politics. It's like, no, 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 don't question the force. I haven't gotten my hands on it yet. After I get my hands on it, then maybe we can talk about it. But I want to get my hands wrapped around that gun of the state before we question whether or not it should be used. Yeah, I thought it was in, what I came away from, and I had, didn't know this before, but without every law, every... Uh, ordinance, regulation, mandate, without every single one of those, society would cease to exist immediately. What? Yeah. 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 Oh, but yeah. It's like my... Uh, That's the only reason we have society is because of that building over there. The because only reason of the borough Fairbanks, building? Yeah. Oh. Well, not just them. I would say probably them for Fairbanks. The only reason we exist as a society... Well, obviously, if it weren't for the borough, we would all be burning wood, and there would be so much smoke... Here in the Fairbanks area, there that people is. couldn't breathe. No, there already is. Oh, that's I why that they, the river that you can see, see out there through the window, that's an illusion. They actually painted that on these windows. They're oh, not actually windows. Because there's actually just so much smoke. Right? Yeah, you can't mean, see right? anything. Yeah, the black lung. It's endemic here. I'd oh, be yeah. burning tires if it wasn't for that uh, building over my, there. A friend of mine um, had a little run-in with some, some highway patrol the other day. And this is just kind of a funny anecdote. Going into your, you know, without all these laws, we'd be we'd die and we wouldn't be able to exist. So he was in a different state than the car was registered in, and, and the tags were expired, and he got pulled over, and the, the cop was like, oh, this is like a $580 ticket. He said, you you can't drive your car in this state with expired tags. And so my friend goes, no, actually, um, I just was. I was just driving, and I've actually been doing it for like 15 months in this state, and it works fine. My car really doesn't notice what sticker is on the license plate. It's been working great. <laughs> And uh, the cop was just totally confused. He's like, "No, you can't, you can't drive in this state without uh, valid tags and and you know the right license plate." He's like, "No, it, it you are really not does, permitted. It, it is really verboten. Does, it works fine, and Follow you're gonna me. give me a, a you know a, a little bill, and you're gonna go your way, and I'm gonna continue to demonstrate that actually I can drive. <laughs> this vehicle has no trouble operating." with what you call the incorrect <laughs> stickers on it. It's completely immune to the stickers that are put on it. The fuel that goes in the tank, you know, that matters a little bit more. But uh, <laughs> right. yeah, he just didn't get it's it. It's driving without permission. 458-TALK is the number we go to the phones. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hey, this is Sam. Sam, what's on your mind? I was at the Occupy Fairbanks panel last night, and they said something which was interesting, which I think would be interesting to talk about. And what that was is, he was quoting somebody, and he said basically there's only two ways to act in, in society, to organize society and to act in society. And one is the economic means, and the other is the political means. So you can organize society around political means, which tends to be uh, force, coercion, and violence, or you can organize society around peaceful, voluntary trade and exchanges, which is the economic means. So that, that's a pretty interesting way to look at it. I'd like to hear your guys' opinions on that and, you know, any callers who want to call in and talk about it as well. Yeah, uh, that was Franz Oppenheimer. Um, he wrote, a, he's a German guy, he wrote a book, uh, Der Staat, which is uh, the state. And that's what he pointed out. He said he said there's only two ways to to acquire wealth, um, the political means or the economic means. And, and yeah, the political means, um, the political means there's a winner and a loser, Right. Somebody wins and somebody else loses. That's the way it works. And so it's it's competition in that sense. Whereas the economic means, um, economic interaction, both parties expect to be better off. That's why they trade. I mean, that's what economics is. It's just the study of exchange and trade. And people will only trade if they, if they think they're going to be better off. And so in economic uh, so-called competition, you don't have a winner and a loser. You have two parties who are actually gaining utility or feel like they're better off when the exchange is complete. So one of those methods, the, like the political means, reallocates wealth. It takes from, you know, X and gives to Y. New wealth is not created. It's just redistributed. Whereas the, uh, the economic means, because both parties believe they're better off, by definition, that's creating wealth uh, through trade. 
And those are the only two ways that we as humans can can think of to organize society. And so when people say, you know, a society without the statutes and the codes and blah, 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 would be it would just be terrible. Well, all of those functions would have to it, they would be replaced by the by the economic means instead of by the political means. And so it's not a choice of politics or chaos. It's a choice of politics or economics. Right. It's a choice of uh, reallocating scarce uh, scarce resources stealing you know give taking from somebody to give from to somebody else not creating any wealth or peaceful trade and actually creating wealth there there are two things Dave that I I'm itching to say to you right now one of them is that the rhetoric right now that is being bandied about in the public discourse about the not just the occupy movement but about economics in general is almost exclusively political I mean if you listen even to the Republican candidates they talk about competition as if somehow there's going to be a winner and a loser yeah and there's a constant drone in the background that somehow the people that have gotten rich have gotten rich at the expense of poor people of course politicians would think that way because how have politicians gotten rich how have politicians gotten power they have gotten it at the expense of somebody else because yeah and this is one of the things uh, we actually had a caller a couple weeks ago who, who called in and talked about competition versus being able to understand other people and it, competition, we, we think of it in terms of like sports or politics, winner and loser. Economic competition does not produce that. There there are so-called losers in the marketplace. You know, there are companies that go out of business. Uh, but if they if they go out of business, it's only because someone else is actually uh, performing their function more efficiently and creating more wealth for their customers. Or right? because or the their function's no longer it, needed. Or, or the they've introduced no an needed. idea that nobody wants in the first place. Right. And look at how many how many businesses right now are being propped up by government intervention, forcing people to buy a service that they would not otherwise buy. For instance, insurance. How many yeah. people do you know would go out there and buy car insurance if it were not required by law? Well, if it if it weren't required by law, you would have very high personal liability. Um, you would you would see a lot of uh, this is just likely you would probably see a lot of uh, case law precedent. Um, that if you injure somebody and and you don't have insurance, you know you're going to pay out of pocket for that, and so you would likely see uh, a lot of people get insurance just because of that reason. And you'd also see the insurance price drop dramatically. It wouldn't cost anything to have insurance because you wouldn't be forced to buy it. You They'd wouldn't have be, to come get your business. Like yeah, the, the price would likely go down, um, but a lot a lot of people would still have it. Now, people who don't drive much um, or people who you know, are operating a a vehicle largely on their own property or or whatever, right? They they might forego it. They might say, okay, the risk is worth it. I'm going to drive slow or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the the structure might not even change that much. You know, you might not have everyone driving without insurance, but because it's not mandated, yeah, certainly the pricing structure would have to change. There would be a competitive bidding process too. Right now, you can't buy uh, certain forms of insurance across state lines, so called. Right, and if if the state didn't control the insurance industry, you could buy insurance from whoever you, whoever you wanted, wherever they are. If there was no false state line. Right. Yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just an imaginary imaginary line. Uh, <laughs> Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Uh, good morning. This is Natalie. Natalie, what's on your mind? Hey, well, I wanted to bring it back to Sam's question on this um, kind of economic law or political law. And um, I think we see that all the time at, at the assembly. I know, and especially with this air quality issue that's come up. Um, but I, well, first I wanted to thank David for participating in the panel and such a good job. Um, you know, really bringing some common sense to the panel as well. Um, but <laughs> some some would argue I was doing the opposite, but thanks. <laughs> well, but but see, that's where I think I, I experience all the time at the, the assembly this um, this this kind of conundrum that I think um, Mr. McAdam expressed where he thinks we have to have all these laws and regulations and all these things, or we're going to have, like, this horrible, chaotic society. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've politicized all of our laws. There's no expectations. Nobody can predict. Therefore, you can't have an economic system. Um, We've foregone justice. And I think that justice needs to be there to really have a good economic system and back it up, which is, you know, do what you say you want to do and do not encroach or trespass, you know, clear, defined property boundaries and 
then people can predict and um, exchange fairly with contract. How would you uh, describe the um, politicization of uh, justice? Well, I, 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 would, I guess I would describe it as that we, we, we change laws all the time. We're constantly, um, it, it, at the Assembly, we're constantly coming up with uh, new ideas and changing the laws so that it's not predictable, so that uh, people aren't aware of them. We have you know, more and more and more laws Good in the book, point. and you're probably point. writing them all the time. Um, and it's at the whims of whoever is elected. And, and very few people approach it from a principled, deductive logic standpoint. I think that our Constitution and our laws originally in our country were written from a deductive logic standpoint, and we are bringing a different way of thinking to laws today where they're very interpretive, changeable, um, and people are so scared to go back because they think without law, there's going to be chaos. Well, and look and at, just, look at yeah. the national scene too, Natalie. How many laws have we had passed in the last several years that the, even the people who have passed the laws don't know what's in them? Exactly. And and I think I was reading a, a, an interesting book, and, and um, there was a question last night on, you know, uh, I think it was an audience question on, uh, you know, what's in common with Rome and Egypt and all these, these things? And, you know, why did they fall and when these democracies, you know, after about 250 years? And it was because they politicized their law, and there was no justice. Um, they they ended up having a system where people could, could not predict and could not live without playing politics and influencing the politician. And there's nothing to base any of your individual transactions on anymore. It was all about what somebody might do or might say. Isn't that where we are right now? Oh, completely. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to call in about is the, like, that's where we are like, with the air quality issue. There's my nice sound bites about people kind of understanding <laughs> that, you know, a just society doesn't mean you can interfere with your neighbors. And those were nice sound bites. But the, the process that they came up with was all about, well, we're going to do this by individually regulating just different things within your own property that we, we deem um, dangerous for you. And there's a whole industry that's been created to find out that new, you know, that new chemical that's going to be the toxic pollutant of the day mm-hmm. or, uh, the, or the device that is so dangerous to you that we have to spend thousands and thousands of, well, millions of dollars of your taxpayer dollars to test it to make sure it's okay for you. You know, that's what this air quality thing uh, that was this past is. It's not about fugitive smoke or nuisance smoke, you know, across property lines. It's about we're going to save society by, um, Mm -hmm. you know, creating an industry, which is a wasteful, political, politicized industry, to test equipment for you and come up with uh, new toxic chemicals that we identify. I have a quick question for you, Natalie, and I know Dave does, too. Uh, Are you sure, Dave? All right. And, and, I, and I do want you to think about it before you answer, Natalie. So if you don't want to answer now, that's fine, because I understand you are an elected okay. official here in the Borough oh, Assembly. Oh, no, and, I don't. And, no, and, I'm not calling in that. Okay. And, and, but I'm just saying, though, that, that what you say could have some ramifications. So I want oh, you to no, think about no, it no, here very all. carefully. First and foremost, <clears throat> this issue here with the air quality. I mean, we've been told that the only way that we can fight it is if we organize another citizen's petition to go out there and prevent the borough from enacting this new ordinance. Now... I want to know, would it be more effective in the long term if we were to go out there? Because in, in order to do that, all we can do is we can buy, what is it, I think state law. We can only put an uh, initiative in effect for two years, which is why we have to keep on renewing the tax gap at the borough. And so we would be in this perpetual state of continually, perpetually, every two years, putting signatures to get it on the ballot, which obviously will pass, as has passed every single time without question you i mean just huge numbers people saying no way you don't need to be out there telling us what we can burn or can't burn now if we keep on doing that and we keep buying into that system all we need to do is just one time slip up and boom we're back under the the thumb would it would that be more effective or would it be more effective to say you know what go ahead and pass it and we're not going to obey it and we're going to make you spend so much money coming out and trying to prosecute us, trying to fine us, trying to interfere with our our uh, ability to do this, that it's going to cost you so much money to do that, you're, you're not going to try to enforce it anymore. What would be the more effective way, on, on do you think? And, again, I understand if you don't want to answer that question right now. Well, no, I, I just, and I'm not trying to cop out on the question thing. I think you have to do all of the above. I mean, there's a lot more issues than just air quality that you should be, in my opinion, um, you know, nullifying because they're they're arbitrary and, and really don't have any make any sense. 
And when you say nullify, you mean like personally do not comply. Yeah, po- personally, yeah. And and I think that it's, it's, it's you have to really think about it. I mean, it, it, at this point, you know, we're still at the point where the, the state is effectively has unlimited resources. And the danger for them to be doing these, acting on these things arbitrarily if you don't pass that initiative is high. I mean, you talked about the Mike Anderson case. I mean, they selected him out and picked on him. You know, I mean, that could happen with the air quality, the way that it's set up. So I think that it's very important to think about doing the citizens' initiative. And, you know, we can't just do these initiatives and forget about them like, oh, go back to sleep and, you know, we save the day. I mean, this is a, this is something you have to participate in, and the citizens' initiative was fantastic. I mean, I you know I have a problem with certain initiatives because you know they can be mob rule in some ways, but this citizens' initiative was a defensive initiative. It was a protection of everybody's rights, it, you know, not a aggressive act. But how much does and, it cost to have well, initiatives? I don't know, and it can it can cost quite a bit. And, and and I'll tell you that some of the initiatives before, and this has happened before that I've heard of, like it won't be can't be specific. It, it depends. Sometimes when the assembly has talked about initiatives in the past or the legislature, it costs money because they actually give themselves they they actually award money to for advertising and like campaigning for an initiative. So you have to kind of look at that aspect. Well, what about the guy that? Uh... Huh. Which guy? Are you talking about a theoretical guy? How about or these? Uh, guy? <laughs> let's talk about the cronyism with the uh, air quality. How do you have people that are actively getting a paycheck, basically, to study these things, quote unquote, and then be able to sit in on the borough and vote the way that he does? How come he can't? How come John Davies doesn't have to recuse himself from voting on those things? And, and I, Isn't there a conflict of interest? I would think that there would be, and I think that one of the things is is that pe- citizens have to start paying attention to this. And essentially, the the the, the way it, the system operates right now is y- you can do whatever you want until you're challenged. Uh, so I, it would. Yeah, go no, go for it. Oh, go no, keep keep going. No, Dave, go oh, I have a, a question that I would I think would be interesting for you to post to the EPA next time they're around. Um, okay. Do they regulate the emissions of the bombs that the U.S. military drops? <laughs> <laughs> Regulate bombs. Okay. I mean, you were you were talking about how you know they're they're keeping us safe from these devices that could hurt us and regulating our air pollution. Uh-huh. Um, isn't it the same? This is the the federal government, the EPA. Isn't this the same federal government that developed the nuclear bomb and mm-hmm. put more radiation into the atmosphere than than anyone else ever? <laughs> Uh, well, yes. And, is it, and, so, so what? You know, so they're they're spending our money to to come after wood stoves, and then at the same time they're d- dropping explosive devices and chemical devices. And, we're we're coming up on the end of the show here, real quick. I, I love that question, Dave. I, I because it, it's forcing people to actually think about the logical conclusion of where this is going. Natalie, you're going to be in the studio on Wednesday. Yes, I can, I can be there. I'm wonderful. Sure. I'd love to continue this conversation with you at that okay, time. Thank you. Uh, real quick, gentlemen, uh, I know all the lines are on hold. We're not going to have time to get to them, so I'm going to bring it to a point here. Do we have an action point for today? What can we do in light of what we've discussed this morning? Uh, people just need to go out. They need to think outside the box. Um, if you're exploring only political solutions to your problems or to the problems you perceive in society, uh, it, it's time to look elsewhere. I mean, political solutions to problems that were created by politics probably aren't going to work. You know, you're probably digging the hole deeper if you're in the bottom of the hole and you got a shovel. Come out of the chaos. I mean, this is the real chaos. That's the chaos. The real chaos is what goes on in that building over there. The goes creation on the of more laws that are supposed to yeah, be. That is chaos. Oh, no. I mean, what Dave, what we advocate is not chaotic at all. Well, like it's well, the exact opposite of chaos. Yeah. Po- political law, right? Not, we're not talking about a lawless society, but like Natalie talked about, political law, law that's that's arbitrary, law that has no checks on it, um, the, the, you know, the political means. So, so then for that an, cronies it, get to pass to fill their pocketbooks. But and everything, their everything that you're saying here, this is something that is going to take more than something that you can do in an afternoon for an action point. How about how about this? How about people just Google if you've got access to a, a, a computer, Google natural law. And, yeah, and, be a, and, and, be a and Google point. political law. There's a book, uh, Whatever Happened to Justice, by Richard Mayberry, and that's a, that's a good starting point, actually. All right. 
Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, once again, contact information. The uh, the blog is patriotslament.blogspot.com, and the YouTube channel is Radio Free Fairbanks. And I will uh, put a link to that book I just mentioned, uh, Whatever Happened to Justice. I'll put that up on the blog today. And we've also got links now on the KFAR website, kfar660.com, both to the blog spot and to the YouTube channel. So you can go to our website and get uh, instant quick links to both of those that Dave just mentioned. Have a great Saturday. We will see you again. I'll be back in on Monday morning at 6 a.m. for the Better Breakfast Show. And coming up next, it's Health Talk right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio.